This session is sponsored by Oricon, and I'd like to thank Oricon as a session sponsor. Today, uh, we're going to be exploring the infrastructure, uh, sorry, today we're going to be exploring technology, technology enabled sustainable infrastructure. The infrastructure sector must develop and maintain long-term assets that will meet changing demographic needs while generating net zero resilient inclusive outcomes through the whole life cycle, from planning, design and delivery to operations and beyond. New technologies are helping address these complex goals including smart systems and monitoring, monitoring tools. Today, we will have a, a, an initial keynote address from Alex Grant, the Investment Director for Business Development and Transactions for the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, looking at the future fuel strategy, and then we'll into a panel session. So with, without further ado, and that we're a little bit under, uh, over time, Alex, over to you. Thanks, Patrick. Gotcha. Um, I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the, the traditional custodians on the land in which we meet and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. The transport sector represents a significant opportunity to decarbonise our economy, producing over 100 megatons per annum or 18% of total domestic emissions. Of this, 80% relates to road transport. Battery EV uptake is accelerating and represents almost 2% of the new car market. Model availability is improving, with the 30 odd models on, on the market today set to double by the end of this year. Bloomberg New Energy Finance forecasts that by 2030, Australia will catch up to the rest of the, glo rest of the world with battery electric vehicles approaching 20% of new sales. I'm Alex Grant from the Australian Renewable Energy Agency I'm here today to discuss the transition to zero emissions vehicles in Australia with you. Our energy, our energy system is intrinsically linked with the broader economy, and these linkages are compounding, no more so than in the transport sector. While we're at an early juncture in the transmission to zero emissions vehicles, decisive action is required now to take advantage of the opportunities arising from this period of disruption. We have an, a window of opportunity to work out how to best integrate these new technologies and business models across the existing and greenfield infrastructure before the technology becomes ubiquitous. If the transition to zero emission vehicles is managed well, we can think ahead to reduce any overbuild of capex, we can maintain the utility and performance of our existing assets, and we can capture and unlock the value of these technologies for our broader society. Some of you here today may query the need for intervention, particularly by government. The transition is already underway. In fact, this is exactly the reason why targeted early investment is imperative. By ensuring that issues are considered and measured and addressed well ahead of time, we have the opportunity to deliver a smarter rollout that is integrated with existing assets and set up for the greatest commercial success. Today, let's discuss the journey of zero emissions vehicles. What have we learned from existing projects? What are the trends and opportunities on our doorstep? And how is ARENA supporting this transition? So ARENA was established by the Australian Government back in 2012. Our purpose is to support the global transition to net zero emissions by accelerating the pace of pre-commercial innovation to the benefit of Australian consumers, businesses and workers. ARENA achieves our purpose, purpose by providing grant funding to accelerate innovation in, in projects. And in, in addition to grant funding, ARENA conducts knowledge sharing uh, from our funded projects to leverage the insights they gain for the broader industry. In effect, what they learn is our return on investment. On screen is a snapshot of the types of technologies we've funded over our lifetime. As you can see, Arena's invested over $1.8 billion and attracted $3 of third party capital for every dollar of Commonwealth funding invested. We've been involved in a range of technologies, most notably solar PV, and more recently in large scale batteries, VPPs, demand response, and green hydrogen. Arena has committed just over $100 million to zero emissions vehicle technologies since 2016, including fast charging networks, home smart charging trials, next-gen biofuels, and hydrogen refueling infrastructure. So thinking to the topic today, 
Where have we come from? Arena's role in zero emissions uh, vehicles began in 2017. It came out of an intention to expand our influence outside the electricity sector to other areas of high energy use and emissions. As mentioned earlier, the transport sector is a significant area of emissions and electric vehicles clearly have a role to play here. As the grid and homes continue to have, sorry, as the grid and homes continue to green up, the link between renewables only gets stronger, hence our interest in this sector. From 2016, we started out by assisting you know, the market understanding of, of Australia through funding reports, both the state of play and looking to the future. We've also funded tools aiming at solving the information deficit, such as total cost of ownership calculators, and providing further tools to aid the transition. From 2019, we then focused on range anxiety to, through the support of ultra-rapid highway charges, followed by the first round of the Future Fuels Fund. But since 2020, and noting that range anxiety is by no means solved, we wanted to focus on future-proofing the grid for EVs, and, and particularly how they should be integrated. We wanted to demonstrate that EVs can actually be used to benefit the grid, particularly if planned and integrated properly. So what have we learned? In ultra-fast charging, charging networks are rolling out across the country. Arena is proud to have invested almost $50 million in public charging infrastructure across Australia, helping to deploy over 500 charging stations to a growing regional and metro network. We've seen that high capacity connections are challenging from a development timing and cost perspective, and they vary significantly between DNSPs. For instance, the average time reported for high capacity connection is 18 months. With the slower uptake of EVs than anticipated over the last few years, um, this is impacting site utilisation in, in forecast uh, financial models. AV networks reported that on some sites, less than 1% utilisation was re recorded. Some early insights on charging behaviour have shown that regardless of the charger size, consumer sessions are normalising around a time duration, around 20 to 30 minutes, as a top up, rather than focusing on an energy consumption amount. On the topic of grid integration, majority of EVs are sold with dumb charges or without managing, managed charging in mind. If integrated well, modelling shows that managed charging could reduce wholesale and network costs for all consumers in integrate renewables, such that at 50% renewable energy penetration, smart charging could, could almost be 99% uh, funded by renewables, powered by renewables. So. On the economics, and particularly for fleets, the economics is driven by the residual value and lower operating costs. This means that consideration of utilisation, distance, vehicle size and ownership period becomes increasingly important. The most prospective use cases are fleets with LCVs, ride sharing and heavy vehicle back to base operations paramount. These sectors tend to have the largest barriers, including model availability and charging infrastructure, the highest carbon emissions, but also the most willing uh, EV participants, including councils, state governments and networks. And lastly, on vehicle to grid, supply challenges within the, char the V2G charger not meeting Australian standards have been, uh, have been flowing through but um, recent reports have shown that this is on the way up. So what are the challenges that we're currently facing? On infrastructure, public charging infrastructure, both metro and regional, and private charging infrastructure, as well as fleet um, integration issues, such as back-to-base home garaging and street parking, are all paramount in the industry. Fleet and private charging in particular is a decent upfront cost, um, and typically viewed as an additional cost of the car rather than considered in a holistic part of the electricity uh, cost and low operating um, expenses. In grid integration, EVs are predicted to be the fastest growing demand category in the NEM from the mid-2020s with over one terawatt hour of new consumption forecast in the late 2020s. Grid integration initiatives can help avoid material increases in peak load, unlock new value for EV customers and support the electricity system overall. Areas of focus for innovation include network and market in integration, new tariff structures and smart charging incentives to drive consumer behaviour, and focusing on standards aligned with charging data. 
on the economics, the high upfront cost is not always factored into the, the analysis of a TCO. This residual value risk stems from the lack of a second-hand market. Regarding commercial and education factors, businesses are looking to create EV fleets uh, and, and finding novel solutions, but it's still early days, with complexity seen as a major barrier. A large question is, who is best placed to manage these risks right across new and innovative business models? And lastly, on model availability. Although passenger car availability is improving, there are great difficulties seen in the availability of light commercial vehicles. In heavy vehicles, again, this is still limited, apart from mining, and there's no clear winner yet emerging on the technology type, battery, battery swap model, or even hydrogen. Apologies for the small font here, but I'd just like to, to put on screen some of the parties that are involved in this sector. And just to show that zero emissions vehicles brings together uh, many non-traditional partnerships, um, people who are considering this role in, in you know, whether it's across logistics, um, BAU, or new opportunities and uh, foreign markets first, first coming to Australia. This demonstrates how many sectors of the economy are considering the, the impact of zero emissions vehicles and what to do with this emerging uh, opportunity. So what is ARENA and the federal government looking to do about this? The Future Fuels Fund, oh sorry, as the centerpiece of the government's future fuels and vehicle strategy, the Future Fuels Fund focuses on investments to address barriers to low emissions vehicle uptake, partnering with the private sector through a co-investment model to deliver a total of over $500 million in enabling infrastructure. The program was expanded late last year to deploy $250 million across business fleets, new technologies for long distance and heavy vehicles, and public charging and hydrogen refueling stations. It also will look to incentivize households to use smart chargers to boost the reliability of local electricity networks. Future Fuels Round 2 opened in February uh, this year with $128 million uh, targeting to support fleets to shift to new zero, zero emission vehicle technology over the next four years. Funding will be available over a couple of focus areas, including light vehicle fleet operators for charging and electrical infrastructure, while heavy fleet operators are eligible for this funding, as well as some support for vehicle, vehicle costs, considering the premium is two to three times the upfront capital. Arena is also looking to fund projects that incorporate hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and refueling infrastructure. In closing, I'd like you to take away these three points. The transition to zero emissions vehicles is here, it's accelerating, and we need targeted action now to ensure the full value of the opportunity is realised. Current challenges include the rollout of new infrastructure, grid integration, and the economics and innovative business models that are required. Arena is supporting Australia for the Future Fuels Fund, and we're actively seeking participation from a wide range of business. It's been my pleasure to present to you today. If you'd like to know more about the Future Fuels Fund, I'd encourage you to visit our website uh, to read the guidelines and also register for a webinar that we're having next week on Monday. Thank you very much. So we're now going to move on to a panel session. I'd just like to introduce my fellow panelists. Um, Firstly, Norica Wynn, Futures Research and Strategic Foresight Lead at Oricon, a global engineering and design firm, many of you will be familiar with. Norica works with Oricon and its clients to plan for the future in an uncertain world. She draws on a multidisciplinary background to anticipate how and when change occurs in different types of systems. I'd also like to introduce Ch uh, Sasha Chandler, partner within the Integrated Infrastructure Team at PwC Australia. PwC Australia is a multidisciplinary firm that works with businesses, government and the community to deliver solutions and sustained outcomes to help Australia continue to thrive. Sasha leads a team that's tasked with the design and development of contemporary technologies focused on infrastructure risk prediction and modelling and project stakeholder engagement solutions. And virtually, I'd also like to welcome Andrew Malcolm, Chief Digital Officer at Austal. Austal is a global defence prime contractor and world leader in the design, construction and support of high performance defence and commercial vessels. Andrew is responsible for defining group level strategy and leads implementation of commercial strategic initiatives 
as well as Austal's R&D function, including projects to design zero emissions fast ferries powered by batteries or sustainable fuels, advanced manufacturing technologies, and smart ship systems that utilize machine learning to optimize vessel operations. So the typical question is, who'd like to kick things off? Um, one, one of the themes that we were talking about earlier this week was that infrastructure is an investment enabler to unlock the energy transition in the broader transport sector. Um, I think so before, as to who'd like to kick those off. Maybe Andrew? Yeah, sure. And please stop me if, if the audio is not clear as well. Loud and clear, thank you. Excellent. Yeah, so with, uh, with ferries as an example of, of uh, floating infrastructure, um, there are uh, a key part of any, uh, any location uh, or city which, which, uh, which puts them in place. Um, historically always fueled by diesel, but as we're looking to power them now with, with batteries or with hydrogen or, or other renewable sources, um, there's clear question marks about availability of, of infrastructure and supply at the jetty, uh, which was never there with diesel. Um, but what we see is the uh, ferries or, or other large infrastructure pro projects are, are really um, single point source demand for these, uh, for these fuels or for um, charging infrastructure. Um, and what that provides is a, a reliable offtaker um, and, uh, and a base load um, for these investments, whether it's supply chain investments or upstream production investments. Um, because in most cases, um, th these, uh, these vessels are a part of um, a, a fixed operating profile. They're going to run eight hours a day, seven days a week, 10-year, um, 20-year licenses. And so it really does provide that that uh, underpinning um, uh, opportunity to uh, close a chicken and egg problem that we see around people making investments in, in the upstream infrastructure or the logistics. Th thanks, Andrew. Um, Norica? I think one of the characteristics we're seeing as we move forward is it's going from a one-size-fits-all. Diesel solved many, many problems. Petroleum solved many, many problems. And now we're facing a fragmenting energy environment. And we have to be far more specific about what we apply where. And that's not just a question of what we use to substitute in the vehicles, the trucks, the ferries, but also what happens in the infrastructure that surrounds it, what happens in the economies around it, what happens in the workforces around it. And that is increasing the complexity of the business environment. It's increasing the complexity of the supply chain, which also then increases the complexity of decisions and optimizations that we have to make across that. And one of the things that is really interesting is how technologies and other sectors like digital technologies, machine learning, AI, big data is going to be a big part of how we manage that complexity, how we provide the information that lets people make decisions. Um, for example, that Andrew has given um, earlier this week that some ferries will have blended fuels and some won't. And the perching decisions that people are making and then what needs to happen to supply these ferries. So, in moving to this complexity, we have to actually rethink how we think our systems. We have to think about the trade-offs we make across systems. And that's changing how we understand what those supply chains look like. And one of the really interesting things that's emerging is the fact that we're seeing partnerships between new actors and the roles that they play in those systems being redefined. Water utilities are now entering the energy market and becoming energy providers. And that is fundamentally changing what role and what their identity is in the system. At the same time, you're seeing energy companies or arena going, we're not just the electricity, we're energy more broadly and that whole infrastructure supply chain. And as these roles and identities shift, the partnerships shift and get restructured. And basically, going back to my earlier point, that increasing complexity means we just have to be far more aware of how we play in that and how we what kind of system we're working in. I could go on for ages on that one. <laughs> yeah, I think, can you hear me? Yeah. Another example of that, um, our firm at the moment is staring into what it might look like to replace all of the bus fleet here in New South Wales. Right? There are 8,000 buses on the road and they're all of varying ages. So you can't just flip 8,000 buses out and then flip straight to electric in that process. So you need to look at the profile of redundancy in the fleet. But at the same time, you've got a huge transition risk that occurs there because what are you going to create? 
you know, the engineering and maintenance facilities that allow you to service both your diesel and your, you know, electric vehicles simultaneously, which doesn't work either. Um, you know, some of these environments, the electrified environments, actually have a larger um, real estate footprint than they used to. So there's, there's always these opportunity costs or trade-offs to being able to do this responsibly. So you start to need to model what that transition state is going to look like and to be able to demonstrate that you can actually make that transition responsibly. There's technology risk involved in that, in that most of the batteries in these vehicles have got a, an eight year life cycle on them. So we actually haven't got a jurisdiction in the world that's been through a full life cycle yet, right? I think in the UK they're coming to that point where they're going to have to do that. So the life cycle of these technologies, the sensing devices that we're going to back to base type sensing advice, uh, uh, devices that give us all of the data that we need to know how those assets are going to operate um, over time so that we can build efficiency into the system. So you start to model that and all the way through the supply chain and the lifespan of these assets, there's a huge amount of data there that needs to be taken back, run through AI, run through predictive models so that the sustainable outcomes that we're actually looking to achieve from this can be modelled in and we can plan for them and make sure that we're achieving them through good management and, and focus. Yeah, I guess one, one example that, that you touched on there, um, Tasha, was that when, when you have these, these assets that, that do have a long life that you need to think about the, the, the whole you know, retirement and the decisions you make today are baked in for a number of years. Mm. There, there are a number of no regrets pathways that we can take today and um, smart charging is, is one of those where um, the cost is incremental um, a number of parties recognise that it's, you know, it's functional, it works, it's there, um, and we can figure out the systems later. But if you don't you know, take action to set up you know, for success, you end up with a you know, similar system to the solar PV and causing issues with the duck curve, things like that. So there are a number of no regrets um, pathways that can be taken today um, that don't necessarily um, have as much of an impact, and we don't need to do the biggest and hairiest uh, problem in the room. Um, uh, Norica, no, you mentioned that you know, you, we can't look at infrastructure in isolation and, and I guess you know, the customers and, and the end users are, are one of those items. Um, Sachi, so, so you were talking about this earlier uh, today. Yeah, um, we, it's certainly my belief, and I know it's a belief shared by a lot of people I talk to in industry, is that to get this to be sustainable and to perpetuate the kind of momentum that we want behind everybody caring about the planet and being willing, because you know, there will be increasing costs in certain services um, as a result of this, is we've all got a role to play in advocating for that. But I think getting the community as close to and aware of what sustainable, sustainable outcomes looks like in the infrastructure sector is really important. I mean, one of the technologies we started playing with was what we call sentiment harvesting. And that is when a large project is looking to mobilise, what cohorts whether it be community, political, bureaucratic, industry bodies, can we go and very conveniently and quickly harvest sentiment from so that we can see what people's expectations are of these assets, but then based on those expectations or interpretations that the community have about what these investments are going to um, yield, allows us to be able to communicate on an ongoing basis because you come out of the design of these and then you go through the build and it can be disruptive you know, in those community spaces. But if people understand that, then they have the ability to engage with better. So we use the sentiment all the way through and you keep harvesting over a period of time and you start to look out through smart AI and analytics is where have we got divergence in cohorts, where have we got synergies, where have we got the need for education, because it's not a set and forget it planning and going into construct. Um, and you get a better idea of how those assets are actually going to be utilised by the community that they're there to serve when you understand what their journey through and understanding of that, those, those infrastructure asset, assets has been on the way through. And then you continue once those assets are live to use those sort of technologies and har sentiment harvesting and whatnot to see how the community is engaging with that on an ongoing basis. And that this environment's so, so rich with data. I don't want to offend anybody by saying my belief in the infrastructure sector, 
is that we haven't got anywhere near some of the other industries in being able to collect that data, run it through smart systems with some fantastic insights that we can generate and put that in front of people and communities so that they can come on the journey with us. That's, that's my view on connection of community to infrastructure and outcome. Okay. Um, Andrew, maybe just throwing to you, um, you know, Austin's perspective on, on how the customers. Oh, okay, right. We, we, we might we might go back to that then. Um, I think just touching on that. Data having, having audio problems. Okay, touching on that data conversation is so much can be done to optimise what we already have. Um, and that's in pretty much every industry and asset class. The problem is, is we don't have the data to do that. Um, and if we do have the data, it's not organised. And continuously what we hear is within organisations, let alone across the supply chain, across the system, across between um, the users versus the providers versus the owners, is they don't trust the data. So how can we do things and optimise things and trust that we're going somewhere if we don't trust the data? And the infrastructure industry is one where this is seriously going to hold us back, um, particularly if we want to start to make these decisions from a sustainability context. I think one of the things, um, there was a study that came out of Nature, so I need to speak louder, <laughs> um, about two years ago, which said the amount of man-made mass is now more than all the biomass on Earth. So humans and our economies have now created more mass than what exists in nature. And there's going to be a shifting social license around that, around can we continue to extract? Can we continue to just build more with more resources? And the futures we're facing is we've got to do more with less. We've got to do better with what we've already got. And the digital technologies are going to be fundamental to that. But there's a big transformation about how we use data, how we trust data, alongside that. So if industry is having to catch up to the edge of digital, at the same time it needs to incorporate new data sets because that's the other thing that's emerging, um, particularly in the sustainable infrastructure space, is Britain just released a satellite that can measure heat loss from an asset. So they from space can say, this building has lost this much heat. This asset is producing that much heat and that is waste to a certain extent of energy. So it's going to be other jurisdictions that are measuring how effective we are, the decisions that we're making, who are owning that data and keeping an eye on what's happening. So not only do we have to go, how do we understand what data we do have, there's whole new technologies emerging that are going to increase the amount of data that we have on environmental issues, on asset condition, on underground. So what can we use to get data from underground? So I suppose that's a call to action here is what role do we need to rethink about what we understand about our assets to actually move through the sustainability journey that we're on? Just, just on that one, I think the onus is on collaboration and in industry to do it right because the data, yes, is inconsistent and but there's huge volumes of it out there. Um, I don't think we're ever going to get to a point that we get everybody to be completely consistent with the data, but we need to create the mechanisms through which, and the technology now exists, right, to pull a huge amount of data ingested into these models from inconsistent data sets to then normalise that to be able to drive some really good intelligence from it. But we need the collaboration in industry, and we've seen all sorts of attempts at doing that in different spaces, but we're trawling the globe at the moment looking even for um, big project, mega project infrastructure data sets that we can use to do historical you know, Monte Carlo type simulation and risk projections with correlation then through to um, you know, cost overrun risks and, and all sorts of parameters that we'd like to run. We just we can't find it because it's not. But I think if industry came together, and I don't think it's necessarily overly sensitive data, but um, um, I don't think it's overly sensitive data. Um, let's work out what those data sets are, what we're willing to share, and, and get on with sharing it because the insights, the bigger the pool grows exponentially, the, the insights correlate directly to that. So, yeah. Okay. Andrew, if you're there, um, what, I guess any, any insights to the data or, or, or perhaps the customer use um, case that you found on, on the, the hostel side of things? I'm still not getting audio.
that one works. Um, I guess there was one more topic which was raised during the week, and that's just given the complexity of the sector, um, the need for systems thinking, and even systems of systems thinking, uh, is going to be required for current constraints, let alone those that come through. Um, Noriko, can I ask for you to comment on that? Sure. So I think what's really interesting is that, well, I mean, I work in the innovation space as well, and so the question that comes around where do you innovate comes down to understanding your value chain and knowing where you can do something differently. And so few organisations actually understand their end-to-end -end value chain and then how it might interact or intersect with another organisation or the community or the broader system. And so part of what we're seeing as we need to move forward is a deeper understanding of the adjacent systems to us, um, to whatever part of the system that you're in. A deeper understanding, and not just how it's structured, but the flow. Is it the flow of information that's the constraint? Or is it the flow of materials? Or is it the flow of people or the flow of ideas? Um, is it the flow of energy? That's an issue. And we need to understand the systems at different levels. We need to understand how the systems interact. But increasingly, we're seeing how do we get the systems to work together? Um, how do you coordinate across systems? So I've got a couple of examples of this. Is We talk about autonomous vehicles as being a sustainable transport option going forward. But then we had the question of how does the autonomous vehicle system interact with the light rail system, interact with the train system, interact with the mobility of the service system? And we can't make decisions just based on the autonomous vehicle system. It's how do each of those systems need to coordinate? And right now, we're struggling to go, well, what decisions and trade-offs do we make across them? And we're shifting from having to make decisions just based on a mode of transport across all modes. And at the same time, we're having to shift between complexity of actors within that system. So that's just um, one example. I think there's another really example, um, listening to the talk before this one, about we have to start thinking about nature-based assets and offsets across regions, which means you're not making trade-offs within a region anymore. You're making trade-offs across regions for biodiversity and understanding some of those interactions. So we have to have the capabilities to go down into the detail, but simultaneously move up and make decisions across all those scales and across different types. So we've got to now have an increase in literacy thanks to the Task Force for Nature disclosure around biodiversity. We've got the literacy around climate change, literacy around decarbonisation versus net zero. Um, and we're facing a, <laughs> a population that's only, to a certain extent, learning these topics, learning about the complexity within these, yet we're going to have to accelerate to go even further and go faster. So when we think about systems, we've got to think not just about the system we're in, but the other systems we interact with, which takes a very different way of decision making as well as you go forward. And is that, is that race for electrification and battery and all that? I was horrified. I was sat in something on the 18th of December, just before we all broke for Christmas, and we had a speaker there that was talking about the fact that the demand for the inputs to battery production outstrips the potential supply by many times, right? So what does that mean? That means we're going to have this rush to pull the stuff out of the ground and to get it onto ships and to get it overseas and to get it manufactured into batteries. I guess I sit there when I hear that and I think to myself, how do we do that responsibly? How do we do that with respect for land and First Nations? How do we do that um, you know, without actually damaging what we're doing? So to that supply chain you know, perspective and as somebody that needs to assure, as does you know, ISC, that um, industry are not making ambit claims about we're going to get to that outcome and it's going to be sustainable, we do need to stare all the way back to where it's coming out of the ground how it's being transported, how it's getting on the ships, where it's being produced, and some of the ESG you know, standards, and I know that's you know, a hot topic right across industry at the moment, are going to necessitate that before anybody can make those claims or commit those um, you know, to shareholders and others, that we do have that full visibility and line of sight all the way back to source and all the way through the value chain to say sustainable is sustainable. You, you meant, it's interesting you mentioned the front end of the supply chain. Because increasingly around electrification of transport, we have to start concerning ourselves with the other end. So we've got batteries, we've got solar panels, and some of these haven't even gone through whole of life cycle, hmm. and they're not recyclable. And so what do we do as these technologies come offline, get replaced? We've got these 
in some cases, quite toxic waste. And so we're seeing movements around um, mandating recyclability of batteries um, and regulations being proposed to say 30% of battery material has to be recycled, which then creates whole new industries in the ecosystem too, whole new actors, whole new players. And I think it's those technologies um, in the sustainability of infrastructure space that lets us do better at the other end. It lets us make better use of existing materials lets us reuse things, lets us find secondary markets. Um, design for deconstruction could be huge for the infrastructure industry, particularly when you couple it with 3D printing. Instead of replacing a whole line of pipe, what if you could just replace small parts of it using 3D printing with new materials? Um, so in that context, technology that enables us to do better, to manage better, and to replace parts instead of whole could be really interesting. Another one is intensification. So instead of replacing a whole water plant, how do we intensify operations within it? So we don't have to completely replace everything we build. And we're getting the technologies that allow us to do that. We're getting the technologies that become smaller as they become more powerful, which is just a technology trajectory. So a question might be, it might be big and unwieldy now, but in 15, 10, 10 15 years time, it could be in your house which is another complexity to draw into the energy system because are we going to see fuel cells in our houses? Will that provide us with water? Or will that be part of our own community networks? Is some of the far future um, community-based infrastructure stuff we're observing all looking at. And are you going to rely on consumers to do the right thing or how do you, how do you automate it so there's still choice um, but also to get the outcomes you want? So, no, very interesting. It um, came up in the bus conversation actually. Um, one of the little tangents that the conversation went off on is um, an example is over in India the buses can be taken instead of sitting them dormant overnight they take them to villages and they actually are a power source for the entire village and you think about the situation we find ourselves in now with the flooding and whatnot but and remote communities being stranded just how important an asset like that could be um, so that utilization and the optimization of um, how we can use these assets for our communities is something technology is definitely enabling for us. And, and those unintended outcomes too, where people buy a car and they think like for like, you buy a battery electric vehicle car and you plug it in, but actually you've got that you know, potentially vehicle to grip capability, resilience, mm. and then how, how do you actually orchestrate that? Um, big, big questions, um, stepping stones there. But um, Well, that's a really interesting piece that I'm exploring at the moment, that vehicle to grid, because that changes some of the public sector or public transport dynamics. That some of the futures we see and that we would promote sustainability or increase public transport use or um, shared economy. So you don't own your own car. But what impact does vehicle to grid where your decision is I'm going to have my car as part of my home energy system to power my batteries, does that mean that we no longer or it's harder to move to a sharing economy space? Which some, and I'm not going to put a lid on this, say is actually the more sustainable option if you take a full material life cycle analysis. So there are these interesting ways in which different technologies interact with each other and how people use them that actually shape the broader infrastructure environment. Um, one of the things that I do in my work and in my field is we talk that we shape our technologies, so we build these technologies, but then how we use them changes the technologies themselves when they get put into communities, um, when we then adapt how they get used, that changes the technologies again. And that's the really interesting questions because we only ever really tend to ask what happens when we put a technology into a community, into a network? We don't tend to ask how will that network change the technology? And that's what comes next. And that's where you then get more fragmentation and next wave of innovation. And another point to that is it's so context dependent. A city, every city is unique as a fingerprint. Communities have got unique assemblages. So how they interact with their technology um, is going to change how it might evolve through that space. In India, we're seeing buses being used as secondary power sources. Um, but in other places, they could be forming part of the grid firming when they sit idle in the depots. So understanding that community interaction and what comes after becomes important because that lets you anticipate how things might get shaped, community acceptance, but then also when you go to design to implement these technologies, their acceptance, whether or not people want them, how they might use them, 
um, how frequently they get used, which then has maintenance implications. Perfect. Um, we're going to move to Q and A in a second. In a second, sorry. So please pass through any questions you may have. Um, maybe just to kick things off, um, Sasha, can I ask you what's the the best kept secret uh, that you've come across in the last six months with regards to sustainability in infrastructure? I've only got certain clearance to discuss some of that, but <laughs> putting you on the spot there, sorry. Uh, look, I had a chat with my kids the other day about this particular session, right? And I said to them. Because one of the things that we're doing that just fascinates me, because I used to love playing Sim City as a kid, right? Um, is you can play Sim City now with some of the data that we're getting. And I was looking at some commuter patterns the other day, right? Onboarding, offboarding trains, buses, and having a look at how Sydney's grid moves people around at certain times of the day. Now, if you start to extrapolate out from that, your ability to play Sim City gets really cool, right? Because you know where people are going to be spending money on coffee at a certain time of the day and you can start building commercial outcomes around that sort of stuff. But I took it to the nth degree because one of my other roles has been in uh, distributed ledger technologies and you'd need to understand all the actors in an ecosystem to you know, fully appreciate the value that can come from distributed le ledger technologies. So I was saying to my kids, if you knew in a, com in a commuter system that you could make your own choice about the most sustainable path you could take to get from A to B, would you do it? Well, that'd be really cool, that. You know, and I've got four kids from um, 19 down to seven. And they're all fully engaged with technology. And like my son said, yeah, I'd like to say I want to take 10,000 steps to get to there where I can get an electrified bus to then get on a train network. And I'd love it if somebody could tell me what consumption or what it, he didn't use those words but um, then you get to choose your own journeys and to me it's not the best kept secret to me I'm seeing this stuff emerging and I'm thinking with some really cool people um, and partnerships to work out what's the final community engagement outcome that we can get and I've seen some amazing stuff that we're able to do in that space and yeah, there's a few secrets in that. But it, to me, uh, you probably heard my theme, it's all about connection and community to this because they're the people that are going to keep giving us the ability to invest. Good Come on. And I think to some very engaged kids there, so um, well done. <laughs> yeah, they are. Get them into Yeah. No, no, best kept secret? Um, I might do the poll, I just want to go best um, thing that excites me and just answer the question. <laughs> um, so as with a past life in ecology and botany, I think one of the things that really excites me, and potentially a best kept secret, is the role that plants can play in technology. Um, there's emerging studies that mosses are just as effective at measuring um, air pollution as a man-made sensor. And so, and it's a renewable, tech, it could be a renewable technology and it also can open greenhouse cities at the same time. It can also be found to absorb air pollution. So I think for me is the emerging field about using plants as technology, plants as sensors um, integrated into a broader, um, our human economic system. Great, great. And just, just checking one last time, Andrew, um, best kept secret over in the West? <laughs> <laughs> There's no Wi-Fi. Over to you, Andrew. <laughs> so, I think the audio is back. Yes, I get a, perfect. A nod to confirm. Excellent. Um, your best kept secret from us, I think, is probably uh, just how far Europe has moved, and and it's been difficult to get a sense for it through the last two years, um, remotely and and not being in that market. But the um, the the pull from the customers that we're seeing and the, and our customers are, are ferry operators, so their customers are pulling them. is quite incredible, and I think we're going to see that, that uh, play out uh, in the market here as, as we all start travelling again. No, per perfect. Um, maybe one for me, and one that needs to be louder, is that the technology is here. Um, there, there's nothing to wait. The heavy lifting can be done. A lot of that needs people to lean in, and it re you know, requires communities and, and uh, consortiums to come together, um, propose novel solutions, on the commercial side and definitely on the regulation policy it needs to lean in and have a conducive environment. So that's probably the, the worst kept secret. Mm. Um, not, not getting any questions through the Q&A app, so maybe open to the floor if um, there's a couple. 
And, and, any hands, maybe? You do have quite a lot of them. Oh, do I? Yeah, maybe not. Oh, sorry about that. Right, thank you. Come on. There is a lot. Gosh, there's a couple starred. Do you want to grab a mic and read them out? Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. So, um, that maybe one, one from Danielle Graham. Um, speaking of trade-offs and incentives, what do we think about a price on carbon? There we go. And its potential effect on the systems that we're discussing? Yeah, we need it immediately because that's what incentivised, right? I mean, you start to put things in dollar terms and you start to see people moving. I mean, I, I must say, I'm, I've been very pleasantly surprised by industry's reaction to the COP26 targets. I mean, our phones started ringing straight away around strategy, around how we're going to manage transition, what's this mean for shareholders, you know, the whole lot. I, I, I think, and I don't know if I'm the only one, but I think industry is moving much quicker than I thought it was going to in terms of that. Um, but I think a price on carbon is bang on right now. We need it. And um, I mean, I'm talking to CFOs you know, different utilities and, and private sector organisations and I'm saying just take a theoretical price for carbon now, have a look at your asset base, run that theoretical price through it and have a look at what your hurdle rates become to the investments on your future infrastructure and all of a sudden, you, you know, you start modelling that, you're going to go, wow, okay, didn't expect that. So I think you can get on with it now but we need it so that we can firm it up in a liquid market. Sure. And, and I guess maybe taking that point, business leadership there, we've seen on the last couple of weeks in energy, um, commercials are just driving this and, and business really taking not only the moral position, but you know, economics are starting to play through. So in, in the absence of any other you know, regulated mechanisms, hmm. um, the economics is a strong incentive there. Yeah. Um, Maybe one, maybe one on this for you, Andrew. Um, I seen a mention of ammonia as an efficient and effective energy storage fuel with higher energy density than hydrogen. So, I guess in, in some of the, the solutions you're looking at, does ammonia fit into that equation? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the shipping sector has has lived on fossil fuels happily um, because it's such a, a versatile fuel, and what we're seeing is a real fragmentation across different types of vessels and what will be suitable and what will be feasible. Um, and and every, every one of these alternative fuels actually has a different role to play. Um, one of the big concerns in the passenger ferry market and, and, and I guess it, um, related to, to uh, the infrastructure space is um, toxicity with ammonia. Um, so while it, it's superior on, on, on other, other sort of factors around uh, handling um, and um, some of the constraints on, on, on mass and weight, um, it, there's a real question mark about uh, safety concerns um, when we put that on board a, a vessel with a thousand passengers, for example. So uh, not as clear that it will be a solution for the ferry market, but uh, a lot of the, the other shipping sectors are looking very, very actively at ammonia. Great, thank you. Um, Sasha, question, question for you, just relating to the, the bus example you mentioned earlier. If we convert to zero emissions vehicles by 2030, what do we do with all the existing fossil fuel vehicles, such as buses that may still have a residual operating life of 20 to 30 years? Yeah, and that's what I was talking about in terms of understanding how you do that responsibly through that transition period. I mean, there will always be a market for those vehicles. Well, over a period of time, probably till the end of their life. I don't know yet what the technologies look like because obviously can you retrofit an electric powertrain you know, to what was a diesel chassis, diesel engineered chassis? I, I don't have the answers to that. Um, and I don't know what percentage of that bus is recyclable you know, either. Um, so I don't have an answer to that. But I, you know, it's certainly one of the issues in during that transition that we need to be aware of because we could run out of it, as I said earlier, and do it completely irresponsibly in the process because we need to be able to recycle those things on the way through. No, sure. And, and just, I guess, what, what we're expecting in the Future Fuels Fund is um, some of these locally based manufacturers who are looking at components and saying, do we ship over part, you know, partly completed items and, and complete onshore? Um, what, what does that retrofit look like? The business case is there or thereabouts for, for some applications, but mm. um, again, economics will, will drive that. Um, Noriko, maybe a question for you. 
how do we use technology to promote cost and time effective circular economy, and particularly looking at creating new aftermarket supply chains? How the first <laughs> Sorry, how do we use technology to promote cost and time effective circular economy? Um, and, and, and perhaps uh, how do some of these um, features you know, improve our supply chains? Um, so I think one of the things that I've been looking at in this space quite deeply is the role that design plays. We need to design differently. Um, we need to rethink how we design so that there can be a secondary market that maintains a higher value. Because yes, we can recycle construction waste, but it goes to landfill. Um, it doesn't maintain a high value. So first off, design. How do we get better at design? And there's all these emerging design techniques around using computational techniques, generative techniques, um, and automating design that is increasingly going to let us do that and let us model a million different options to optimize for the top four, as opposed to just having to design it once and make the trade-offs upfront and the assumptions or the requirements. So I think that's one. Um, a second one is data. Once again, back to data, that's one of my um, bugbears, but we increasingly need to be able to track those assets through the whole life cycle to create those secondary markets. We need to know what's in a building or what's in an asset. Um, we need to be able to say, once we do go to deconstruct, this is where we can either repurpose it within our own asset base or then start to create those secondary markets. Um, and then lastly, I mean, this is a pretty simple one, is the fact that we can create online markets with greater transparency now, that the information asymmetries are reducing, in theory, um, which should help that. But it starts up front with designing differently. It starts up front with rethinking material usage. Um, and we do, once again, have the technologies to do that differently now. Um, and then I think part of it is just people willing to have the courage to do it is that last piece. So what are the social technologies um, that will let us do that too? Great. Good. Time for one more. Um, might, might take the moderator's uh, prerogative then to ask an answer or a question. But um, the question came through, what are the ideal locations for public zero emissions vehicle charging infrastructure? Uh, are train stations an appropriate location? And uh, th this area, I I'd love to actually see some of the data behind it, but it is fascinating what people consider to be you know, the, the, B, the BAU approach. Um, there was an interview with Tim Washington, who's the CEO of Jet Charge um, on Renew Economy last week. They're looking at uh, long distance trucking. And so typically if you have short times to refuel in, in trucky brakes, um, you can't just get that level of charge uh, from a, from a um, fast capacity. So you know, do you have uh, stops along the way on the highway? Do you look at regenerative charging um, along sections you know, where, where they might have to either pit stop or, or wait. Um, and this is really opens up what does hydrogen play in the space as, as, a, as a liquid fuel um, and, and biofuels to you know, p the potential there. Um, maybe a sleeping giant of Australia and if something can be dropped in using existing infrastructure, is that a transition option? So th these are questions where um, ha having a multitude of technologies available is important, um, but r really looking for that business model and that, that commercial gap um, to be filled and um, yeah, I, I don't envy uh, the logistics people at some of these uh, organisations to fit in uh, that overlay of when do you charge versus um, trucky scheduling uh, versus vehicle usage. Um, do, do you run your batteries down a certain way? Um, do, do, you know, if you're looking at the, the fuel stop pit stops, do you install you know, 40 megawatt charges or do you look to distribute the, the load there? So these are all fascinating questions which um, we expect through the Future Fuels Fund to be learn by doing for some of these big organisations and to, to lean on some of these new partners coming in with smart solutions that um, can take some of that risk away. Nice. So we're almost at time. Pa Patrick? There's one more. I think the interesting question on that is so often we use just direct replacement. We replace something with something else and then expect all the processes to stay the same around it. And we've been seeing this in digital technologies and why we're probably not achieving the productivity we could is because new technologies let us restructure the processes, the behaviours and how we use things and understand things. So 
before are they using decisions based on their existing assets and operations? Or they're thinking, how do these technologies actually let us recreate and restructure and become more efficient? And are they thinking about what could change with the introduction of new technology as opposed to we're just going to use this new technology to extend BAU? And the extension of BAU is a fundamental question of is this sustainable or not? Or can these new technologies help us become more efficient? Um, and that's what we see time and time again in the digital space. And I sort of see sustainability as the next big transformation that we have within organisations at least. Is what do we restructure around the new thing to rethink how it operates? Sorry. <laughs> Fantastic. Probably. Sorry, severely arthritic knee that's starting to freeze up. Um, firstly and foremost, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Noriko. Thank you, Sasha and Andrew. I deeply, deeply apologise for the technical issues, but thank you very much. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a call after this. Oh, awkward. Um, it was really, um, it was really, really exciting to hear sort of this concept that's been flowing through the entire um, through the entire conference of purpose and people starting to come through in the conversation today. Um, and this, this broader idea of the system of systems, um, which I think is the thing everyone is grappling with, uh, whether it be one system or multiple. So exciting to hear sort of the thinking that's going on behind it. And uh, the idea of data, which I think is probably turning into a dirty word at some, at some point or another. Um, but it, it is sort of the, the driving force behind where we're trying to head. So thank you all so much for your insights and for your time. Um, as many of you are aware, at the ISC, one of our core purposes, one of our core functions is the certification of sustainability outcomes for infrastructure. And while we're in our networking break uh, that's coming up right now, we will be certifying a number of projects. So if you would like to hear about some of the great outcomes and, and touch base, we have uh, the LXRP uh, packages um, being certified, West Connex M4 and M5 tunnels being certified, the, CB, the CBD and South East Light Rail project being certified, Western Sydney Airport Earth, Earthworks being certified, the Turak Road Level Crossing Removal Project being certified, the Northern Connector, Parramatta Light Rail Stage 1, Pacific Motorway Upgrade uh, M1, M3 Gateway Motorway, um, the highway, <laughs> High Street Reservoir Level Crossing Removal Project and North Connects. And if anyone can actually repeat any of those back to me, uh, <laughs> there's definitely a chocolate frog or something in there. Um, but please join us for the certifications. You'll see the big media wall and, and the certificates there. Other than that, I'd like to thank Transport for New South Wales as our, um, as our platinum sponsor and thank Oricon for, for sponsoring this session. And thank you all so much for your time and look forward to speaking to you at networking. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.